evening, everyone. On behalf of our whole family, welcome to Alec Padamsi, my father's book launch of Let Me Hijack Your Mind, co-authored by Vandana Saxena Poria. This book is extremely special to me and even more special to all of us as it's his birthday today. It's taken us years to get this book to launch date and I'm extremely overwhelmed to share it with everyone. Today, we have a very, very special lineup of prolific speakers, Shabana Azmi, Ronnie Skruwala, Gurcharan Das, Shamak Dava, and Shashi Tharoor, who have made huge successes in their own fields of expertise. And most importantly, they are co-collaborators with Alec over the years. I thank them all for being here to celebrate his life, his ideas, and his alternate vision. Welcome all. The launch is also going to be very technologically interactive and is going to engage you all and your opinions on the new and alternate ideas the book throws up. So are you ready for Alec to hijack your mind and restart your life with freedom? Then let's not waste any more time and reveal the book and its myriad chapters and ideas. Thank you. So let's all, all of us, hold the book up and launch it. That Shabana, Vandana, Ronnie, Gulcharan, Shama, Kwasar, Sharon, Shazan. Woo! That's great. Let's all, fantastic, fantastic. Congratulations all around to everybody, especially to you, Vandana, and of course to Penguin. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the actress par excellence who needs absolutely no introduction, but I shall do it in any case. One of India's most acclaimed actresses, Shabana Azmi, is known for her portrayals of distinctive, often unconventional female characters across several genres. She has won a record five national awards for Best Actress in addition to five Filmfare Awards and several international honors among other accolades. In 2012, she was awarded the Padma Bhushan. So three Padma awardees in one production. Yes, that's right. Padma Bhushan, Shabana Azmi, to, uh, written by Padma Bhushan Girish Karnad, which was Broken Images and directed by Padma Shri Alec Padamsi. Shabana, tell us, in what way did Alec hijack your mind in Broken Images? I mean, that is putting it mildly to say that he <laughs> hijacked my mind because he really took over my life and did it in a way that I am still very, very grateful for. You know, I'd heard all these terrible stories about the horrible temper he has and I react very badly to bad tempers and I had told him right in the beginning, Alec, if you want me to do what you want, then you can't yell at me. So he took that very seriously. And then the whole process was so interesting, so interesting, because when I first started working with him, I had different notions about how this was to be interpreted between the two sisters. And it was really Alec prodding me on and pushing me in the direction of how I could reinterpret uh, the part. We're going to now share with you some interesting facts about what's going to be happening this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, the chat box will be open for the last 10 minutes for those of you who'd like to share or ask questions to the co-author, Vandana Saxena Poria. And, um, Actually, this book would not have started and would not have been completed without the effort and energy of the co-author, 
Vandana Saxena Poria. She is an OBE and on the top 100 UK Indian influencers list. She's known as the human alarm clock due to her disruptive thinking, which ignites people into action. Vandana spent three years collaborating with Alec on this book prior to his passing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vandana Saxena Poria. Hi there. Hi, Ryan. How are you doing? All good. So good that we finally reached D-Day, Vandana. <laughs> so let's cut. Yeah, I agree. So let's cut to the chase. I want to know why did Alec want to write this book and what was his compelling vision? So really, Ryle, um, as you know, Alec was really concerned about the social norms that everyone was following. Um, and he really felt that people had outsourced, right? We outsource everything. He really felt that people had outsourced their thinking. Um, he felt that they'd outsourced their thinking millennia ago to religion, where religion told you what to do and how to behave, then to government, then to society, then to family, et cetera, et cetera. Family, you know, for example, uh, you must be an engineer, you can't go into theater. You know, so we have all these social norms around and as a result, everyone becomes sheep. Now, what's the impact of that? The impact is that everyone is actually miserable. They're not doing what they really, really want to be doing because of these social norms that have existed for years. And Alec and I, when we kind of analyzed the world, we realized actually what everyone was looking for was belonging, safety, and love. And with those three things, you didn't look for recognition, you didn't look for power, you didn't look for anything else. You were just you know, interested in helping yourself thrive and other people thrive. And so the point of hijack your mind is actually Alec is asking people to hijack their minds from the outsourcing and reclaim their minds and start making decisions because as a result, you'll be happier. And as a result, other people around you will be happier too. Right, that sounds exactly like him, Vandana. So what kind of social norms are we talking about? Can you illustrate or give us a couple of examples? Oh, <laughs> with great pleasure. I mean, just think about the schooling system. At the end of every year, you have to do an exam. And based on that exam, you go to the next grade. And that happens all through school. And that happens at university. You have to pass the exam to get to the next grade. And then in the workplace, you have to have an appraisal every year before you get promoted, et cetera, et cetera. But there's one contract that adults enter into knowingly that has no renewal. In fact, there's no expiry date on it. It is until death do us part, and that's marriage. So here's one of Alex's um, ideas. He's saying it's not about divorcing or separating, but what about if we had a five year renewable marriage license? So that, you know, two people will come together and every five years they would have to reconsider, am I being the ideal partner? Am I looking after my other, you know, the other person in this marriage? And basically both people would have to agree and only then it would be renewed. Now, if we brought that in, how much happier would people be? And, you know, with so many different chapters, so many interesting, you know, diverse ideas, chapters like my 1000 best friends. And in fact, that is what we were talking to Shabana about, because that's what he says that, you know, I have a thousand best friends and everybody's like intrigued. You can't, it's impossible. But, you know, he feels that all the characters and all the plays he's directed are truly his best friends because he knows them so perfectly and he can really, really relate to them. And that's what he, uh, you know, goes on to explain in the chapter. So chapters like that and speaking the unspoken dialogues. How do you feel that Alec is going to, um, how does this book help people, you know, hijack their minds, their yeah, own minds? Great question. Great question. Um, and to answer it, I'll just tell a very quick story. Um, when I used to go and meet Alec, and I spent a lot of time, as you know, with him, um, often I'd be there for seven or eight hours and people would come in between to have meetings. So I'd be shunting, shunted out of his room and I'd be with a copy from Ida and I'd watch people walk into his room and they would look upset, you know, kind of down and out, etc. Because most people came to see Alec if they had a challenge. 
and they'd be in the room for like literally 15, 20 minutes with him. And they would come out with a spring in their step and ready to face the world again. And I remember one saying to him, Alec, it's unbelievable. You're like a, a battery recharger. You recharge people. And he got really angry with me. He shouted at me and he said, no, I'm not. And I was like, you know, in that deep voice. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've insulted him. And he said, no, darling, you and I are magnetizers, not batteries. We magnetize people so that they can go out there and magnetize others. A battery runs out of charge. I, darling, do not run out of charge. And I think that is the power of this book. This is his legacy. He is not gonna run out of power. You are gonna read this book again and again, every time pick up a different idea. And then what he wants you to do is go out there and magnetize other people so that we can create the world that we really want to live in, not the one we're given today. Okay, great. And as promised at the beginning of this launch, it's going to be technologically interactive. So to begin with, our first poll, Vandana is now going to take the lead on this one. And let's see what comes up. Vandana, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so we have our first poll question coming up. Uh, if we can put the poll up, please. Just a couple of questions about you. Now, as Shabana mentioned, you know, Alec knew the pulse of the audience. And we're continuing that here. We would like to know, this is totally anonymous. We would really like to know uh, your answers to these two questions. Uh, we're gonna give you another 10 seconds on this. You might not be aware, but literally every conversation that Alec had with anyone was polling them or surveying them in some way. Um, he was always collecting insights and he put them together to come out with some really, really interesting um, stories or new ideas. And as a result, um, he, he really understood the audience and he came out with some amazing product. Now I'm gonna give you literally two more seconds to vote. We are, we've still got lots of people voting. Um, I can tell you at the moment, it's almost a tie between male and female, but it is not a tie when it comes to which age group do you fall under. So we're gonna stop the poll now. And we're going to look at the final results. We can share the results. We have got, wow. yeah, there you go. Um, we have got 27% uh, of our audience under 40 and 73% over 40. Now you should know that this book has been written for everyone, but especially Youngistan. So all of you over 40, gift a book to somebody under 25 and see what they think of it. Rael, back to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Vandana. Well, you know, Alec was famous with his pithy quotes, which he concocted and composed all the time on his take on life. And we have decided to call them Alecisms. So we're going to kick off with the first Alecism, and I'm going to introduce you to Ronnie Struwala. Ronnie and Alec met in the theater and Ronnie played his son, Happy. In Arthur Miller's award-winning play, Death of a Salesman, we have some pictures of Death of a Salesman, which we are sharing on the screen. Ronnie is also a first-generation Indian entrepreneur, philanthropist, opinion leader, and author. He went on to build a media and entertainment company, UTV, which after 15 years, he sold to the Walt Disney Company. Newsweek termed him, the, termed him the Jack Warner of India. Esquire rated him one of the 75 most influential people of the 21st century. He has authored two books, Dream With Your Eyes Open and Skill It, Kill It. As a hobby and passion, Ronnie loves to tell stories that must be told through the movies with his new brand, RSVP. So Ronnie, over to you. We'd love to hear an extract from the book. You know, yeah, no, I was struck by the allegism, but, but firstly, really, thank you for having me here. Nostalgia all round. Uh, hi to the whole family, Ryle, Kwasar, Shazan, and Sharon. I even see uh, Johan Jeffrey's tag here. And of course, Gulcharan, Shamak, uh, Shabana, and Vandana. Just lovely to be here. Um, 
the alecism actually stood out and I, I, there wasn't an audio with it. I think Alec would never put a still slide without an audio with it. So I'm going to re-echo that in the chamber and say to execute is to kill because it's all capitals. So then you have to emphasize it. It's time to stop killing the workplace with rules that make people unhappy and start creating a place that all stakeholders want to flock to. And that's a good preamble to this um, half a page or a stanza that I'm reading from one of the chapters on page 62 of the book. He starts with an introduction, but I'll, I'll read the key part that, that really got to me. Don't you think it's time for a new definition of culture? We all talk about culture in the workplace. What about culture of spreading happiness? Actually, I think it's more about igniting happiness, to run a collision course to create happiness. I mean, whatever you do, wherever you go, ignite happiness. As I said earlier, the prevailing culture across the world comes from the corporate culture. So if we make changes in the workplace and our goals and the way we treat people, we will also be able to influence the rest of humanity wherever they are in the world. I, I dare say it kind of rings in a very different way and much more true today as we face with so many things that are going on in the world. It couldn't be a more relevant stanza actually to read today also. He goes on to say, as, Lint, as Lintas proved back in the 1980s and in the 1900s, the world does not have to be about everything being better. And people don't have to run directly after money and power. We can say no. The people who need to do what they are are the people running the corporations. And they are the equivalent of surly, rebellious teenagers today. It is time to come out of your surliness and become the adult we all need in our life. One that understands what his or her employees want deep inside. That starts with the CEO saying no to that American culture of do better and turning into the employee culture of being happier. I can tell you from my own experience, both in advertising and on the stage, that when people are happy, their work becomes their worship, literally. But you don't have to stimulate them to enjoy work when it comes to worship, which is why I say CEO, make way for the CSO, the Chief Stimulation Officer. Nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronnie. That was lovely. Okay, so you said on Twitter recently that you drew a lot of inspiration and life learning lessons in your interactions with Alec, the art of effective communication, to storytelling, to the importance of building a brand that stood for something, to just creative thinking. And um, you said it was all very sum well summarized in the book. Thank you so much. What is the most important thing that you think youngest Khan needs? today and how do they develop it? You know, I want to talk about one because everyone held up the book, uh, but I want to tell you, this is a pad that I inherited because Alec used to have this lined pad in the 80s and 90s. And I was a young, young, young boy at the influential age. And from then on to now, for the last 50 years, I keep printing these pads. Of course, they, they, uh, this one's written, but it's like a blank page. And it always had a two and a date. And I think uh, I can't remember anything with that kind of continuity other than some of the things my mom told me uh, in life that I can see had a lasting impact for almost four to five decades. But that pad, that piece of paper actually sums up today, both for Youngistan and for the 76% Oldistan that are on this call, um, which is, which is to, to the extent to talk about today, we're in a very, very different world. Um, I think there's a lot going on here. Uh, I think what, what influenced me and took me away when, from Alex's point of view is just that level of discipline. I think there's the army for discipline and then there's the theater for discipline. And I think in many ways, there's a lot of commonality. And I took away a lot of that. I think my discipline on thinking, on pre-planning, and just when you think you got it right, you go back again and start all over again. Just that one lesson. Today, we are so fast in our decision making, which in some ways we need to be. We are so uh, reactive in so many things that we want to do that we don't actually. But if you had to do that one thought, that one action, 
And if it was to be just redone or rethought again in a circle, five minutes later, 15 minutes later, one hour later, I can promise you the outcome would be different. So I think one of the strong messages for, uh, for Youngestan and for all of us actually is some of those learnings there. One being really just about that think again context, that, that context that allows you to say, okay, you got it right, now can we try it better? One more time, that one more time has a resonance that actually is very relevant in everything that I've learned and practiced in the last 50 years in my working professional life. That's so true. That's so true. The theater and especially Alec, I think, kind of drill that into us. How much rehearsal? How much rehearsal? Just when you thought you got it right. No. Okay, let's get back to the beginning. And that's life. That's life for everybody yeah. else. And you improvise. And when you get it wrong, you improvise. That's how it works. Just get on with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Never say die. I think that was one of his key, key, key uh, life lessons, you know, never give up. Just keep going till you get it right and better that if you can. So, Ronnie, there's another chapter where, uh, which tells you about the CEO, um, you know, needs to change. The title of the CEO needs to change. And um, what would you say your title today really should be and why? Yeah. No, I think it's a very relevant question today. I think um, less and less people are using visiting cards. The good news is we don't use visiting cards. The good news is, therefore, designations actually are becoming less and less relevant. Why? Because organizations are becoming less and less hierarchical. When an organization is highly hierarchical, decision-making process becomes much slower. It's, and I think today, the less hierarchical an organization is, the less power and meaning of the word CEO is. For CEO, for a lot of people today, it is a, actually an isolated phase. It's a phase which, which demonstrates that you're, you've arrived, that you have a certain sense of power. Whereas actually, some of the most important leadership qualities today is about vulnerability, is about walking the corridors, is about being accessible. So I think today, when you look at that, I don't have a new designation, so to speak. I think each one is to form their own. But I think today the characteristics of just vulnerability, uh, accessibility, being one of many people from that point of view and non-hierarchical is much more what a leader stands for. And to that extent, this chief executive officer with the word chief that makes it sound like hierarchical is definitely in an archaic zone uh, for most organizations, for most fast moving organizations, innovative organizations, thinking organizations. I don't want to make it sound flippant. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. So this is not about what's right and what's wrong. It's not an either or, it's just how you look at it. That doesn't mean that having a CEO and having a corner office is also not a bad thing. Sometimes you have to run things hierarchically, but I think today the, the, the dismantling of Alex's mind of saying CEO, I think in his mind is dismantling hierarchy. This is true. This is true. Thank you so much, Ronnie. And with that, we're going to come up with our next poll and we're going to get straight back to Vandana, who's going to loop in exactly what Ronnie was talking about into the next poll that we have here. So over to you, Vandana. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. You're absolutely right. Uh, Alec wants to see the workplace as less hierarchical um, and he wants to see more vulnerability and accessibility in the workplace. So now the next poll question for you all audience is, if we could change from CEO, which of these could make a better title? And these were some of Alex's choices. Should it be the chief reinvention officer? So the CRO, should it be the chief improvement officer? They should be looking everywhere about what can be improved. Or should it be the VIO, the chief visionary officer? We've got you all voting at the moment, come on. We've got about 10 seconds left on the poll. Which of these do you think is most appropriate? Because as Alex said, chief executive, he doesn't like the executive, Ronnie doesn't like the chief. Let's change it. Let's make it a chief something else. So what do you think it should be? We've got almost a hundred of you, more than a hundred coming up now. Voting, you're still going strong. Come on, very quickly, last couple of seconds, five, 
There is a clear winner. I have to say there is an absolutely clear winner. Any guesses which one? Okay, let's end the poll and let's share. Almost 70% of you said Chief Visionary Officer. I think Alec would be very, very happy. Rael, over to you and some more visionaries that you're going to talk to. Thanks. Thanks so much, Vandana. Absolutely. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, we have another alecism which we're going to share with you. And I'm going to also introduce you to Gurcharan Das. Gur Charan Das was the winner of the Sultan Padamsi Award for playwriting with his play, Laren Sahib, which Alec directed. He also wrote Mira, which Alec experimented with and used the first multi-screen projection unit and mixed media in theater as early as 1972. We have pictures of Mira starring Nirmala Mathan, which we are sharing on the screen with you. Gurcharan Das is an author and public intellectual best known for the much acclaimed trilogy on the classical Indian goals of life. India Unbound, The Difficulty of Being Good and Karma, The Riddle of Desire. He was the CEO of Procter & Gamble India and MD Procter & Gamble Worldwide Strategic Planning before becoming a full-time writer. Welcome Gurcharan. Lovely to have you with us. So, Gurcharan, tell us your quote, you know, um, on the book, uh, which says, if you want to make a life, not just a living, read this book. It's so profound. What would you say is the similarity and connect with Alec and your life? Well, I think neither Alec nor I was content merely to make a living. I think both of us were intent in making a life. We also happen to share a, a love for theater. He as a perform as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a director and I as a fledgling writer. Um, and what I want to really talk about is the fact, is this difference between making a living and making a life. Um, you know, I grew up in a middle class family and my middle my mother who suffered from middle class anxiety uh, used to keep reminding me that I must make a living one day and my one of my earliest memories is really of coming home from kindergarten this was in Lahore, just the year of the independence. And I was carrying a green report card and I came jumping in to the house. And she said, did you stand first? And my father who was sitting at the back, he said, that is the wrong question. You should be asking him, what does he like about school? What's, what, you know, who are mm. his friends? And, and, and what makes True. him, you know, sort of enjoy the whole thing? Or does he hate it? Yeah. And so you can tell that my father was more intent on my making a life. And, and, and really, True. I think Alec is one of those persons who did not sleepwalk through life as most of us do. <laughs> you know, most of us... Hardly. Most of us, actually, we, we grub for marks in school. Then we get a job. We climb, intent on climbing ladders at work. And then when we get into our midlife, no matter how high in the hierarchy we may go, and we ask ourselves, is this what life was all about? And we realize a wasted life. Now that's terrible. And so I think Alec is a, a, a good example of a person um, 
who who obviously thought through life and lived and examined yeah and 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 and, and so and i think this is uh, their their parallels in my case i got right. making in living from my mother and making in life from my father i ask you rail where did he get his making and living and making a life from do you have an answer right i think i do i think i do so basically i think uh, uh, dad had a huge amount of influences in his life when he was growing up and you know he spent a lot of his time in a boarding school which was run by catholic um, you know governesses and headmistresses who were very very strict and value driven so i think a lot of the stuff that he really uh, imbibed and was ingrained in him from a very young age was from them uh the fact that you know all the proverbs all the give back in society live a you know live a very meaningful life and i think a lot of it has come through in the book as well and uh i think from his mother he had to make a living that's what he got from so his mother shared, we shared she was a very strict business lady i mean she was really tremendous um and from his fa- uh, from his brother bobby that sultan padam see the award that you were writing Uh, you know with um i think that was a huge in- influence you know from the arts and uh, how you have to explore and um you know use different ideas and areas to grow i think those were the three of course uh, important uh, influences when he was growing up but of course life is the biggest influence so i think that kind of kicked in big time and uh, you know he was a doer that's all i can say you know he never sat back and said so i'd complain to him endlessly about so many things you know the garbage is not being picked up this that and the other from the age of 12 and he'd say you know what that's not the way to do it write a letter to the bmc get the work done make sure you take some action and at 12 i was busy writing up letters to the bmc so i'm just saying you know he was a great example that he set for all of us so yeah that's to answer your question so, so let me come back to what is it what does it mean to make a life and i think one of his alecisms expresses it because he he, he talks about a company as a place where people come to have fun they become friends and oh by the way they also end up making money for the company <laughs> <laughs> but the reality in but what he's expressing there is the notion that really you must love the work you do and this ronnie expressed it and vandana also expressed it and 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 really um now to love i mean freud expressed half of it when somebody asked him <laughs> well mr freud what's the defin- what's your definition of happiness and freud said well to love the work you do and to love the person you live with well this is not the place to talk about the person you live with but <laughs> nevertheless <laughs> i mean i that i may be a commercial message i've written a book the third in the trilogy was called karma the riddle of desire anyway commercial break is over so so rail actually the fact is how do you love the work you do 68% sorry 78% of the british working people were asked and this is white collar as well as blue collar and they all said they hated their jobs now can you believe something more devastating as a wasted life <laughs> than that true and so i think all true. of us really do need to reflect now both alec and i did it in a way which is similar which is that we wore two hats we wore a monday to friday i wore monday to friday business executive hat and then saturday sunday i changed my hat i wore a writer's hat and so i began writing and uh and as alex says that you take whatever you do seriously the the 
other ways to sell that you love your work. One way is that time gets distorted. You say, oh my God, it's six o'clock. I thought it was four o'clock. So you, you, two hours had gone away. Mm -hmm. You'd lost them because you were so absorbed in your, in your work. The other way is another way, which actually Krishna talks, gives advice to Arjuna in the Gita, which is the famous line about karma yoga, which is to not care who gets the credit. They, people usually translate this differently. But I'm saying that your work will be good if you don't care who gets the credit. Meaning you're so absorbed in your work, you're not worried if it's the next promotion that is going to, going to come to you. So the, to, the, and how to live this way, I think is there again, a Sanskrit word called Lakhima. Lakhima means lightness. So Patanjali talks about it as one of the perfections from yoga. Lightness, you feel light. Mm. Not get burdened by life. L live like a, not like a feather, but like a bird. Light like a bird, uh, because the bird has agency. Anyway, it's, 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 it's one way, and that's really the way to what Alex line in this book, um, that it is the way to freedom, which is of course another Sanskrit word called moksha. And so <clears throat> that's the way <clears throat> I would suggest that live lightly and live an examined life. And yes, you'll have to make a living so you have to do what your mother tells you. Right. But also, <laughs> uh, my mother wanted me to become an engineer. You know, I got a scholarship to Harvard and she wanted me to be an engineer. Yeah. And so I arrived at Harvard right. and they said, you've come to the wrong school. There's one down the river called MIT. You'll get a better engineering education there. But you know, I caught up, got caught up in the romance of the liberal education and I was doing Russian right. novel, right. Greek tragedy, Chinese ceramics, Sanskrit love poetry. <laughs> That's what I did in college. And my mother thought, oh my God, yeah. I, I'm going to have a useless, unemployed son at home. Anyway, <laughs> that's enough. So well, little did she know, Virchar, little did she know what <laughs> how brilliant you turned out and all the wonderful work that you've done and that you've lived, you know, with two hats on. I love that little uh, dramatic play right now with your <laughs> putting on your second hat. But let me come to one quick one also. Um, uh, you know, you'd worked with Alec in the theater. So any anecdote that you'd like to share about that? Well, the only anecdote I have to share is somewhat embarrassing. And, um, you know, this was in the 70s. It's very hard to get good things. Uh, and so I like managed to get a view. This was during rehearsals of Mira. And I like managed to get a beautiful Italian pair of shoes for the star of the play, which was Dolly Taco. And I had a dog named Pali, a little <laughs> Labrador. And the Labrador took a shine to the shoes. And by the time that uh, the rehearsal got over, I'm afraid Pali had chewed up those shoes. <laughs> and I'm afraid the expression on Dolly took it very well, but the expression on Alex's face, <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. want to face that. <laughs> if looks could kill, absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Gurchan. Thank you for sharing with us. And I'm sure, you know, we're going to come back. Um, we also have a very, very special video right now that has been composed and sung by two very special people, Sharon Prabhakar and Shazan Padamsi. Yeah, 
There's a chance to clearly see life's endless possibilities Look ahead, life's an open door All you have to do is ask for more You will never know what you will find So let me hijack your mind And should marriages be for life A five-year license alleviates pain Your partnership will truly thrive With the freedom to start again Your partnership will truly thrive With the freedom to start again Here's a chance to clearly see life's endless possibilities Look ahead, life's an open door All you have to do is ask for more You will never know what you will find So let me hijack your mind Let's stop burdening kids at school I feel that needs to change Let's break the rules and give them tools That engage and edutain Let's break the rules and give them tools That engage and edutain Here's a chance to clearly see Life's endless possibilities Look ahead, life's an open door All you have to do is ask for more You will never know what you will find So let me hijack your mind Hijack your mind was lovely thank you so much Sharon and Shazan they did it all um, you know it's all related to the book so we're really and I'm sure dad would be absolutely thrilled with that okay and now ladies and gentlemen we have a very very dear friend of the family the renowned Dr. Shashi Tharoor Dr. Shashi Tharoor a third term member of parliament for Tiruvannantapuram He's the best-selling author of 23 books, both fiction and non-fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Hello, I'm Shashi Tharoor, and I'm delighted that we're celebrating the wonderful Alik Padamsi's 92nd birthday with the launch of his book, Let Me Hijack Your Mind. Well, it's not really his book and that Vandana Saxena Poria took the trouble of conducting a number of extended conversations with him, distilling the wisdom rendering them into fluent and readable prose and making a book out of it. But the book, in so many ways, embodies some of the finest qualities of the provocative intellect that Alik Padamsi was. We've all known him in his various avatars as a creative genius, as an ad man extraordinaire, and in my own case, as a theatre director, because as a young man, I was a, a student of his then wife, Pearl Padamsi, at Campion School, Bombay, and um, he would often come in and give a, a friendly, husbandly hand when it came to directing her perhaps raw and unready charges. So my first exposure to Alec was when he came over to help her in directing Oliver, the musical play in which I played the artful Dodger. And some of my more memorable experiences were hearing Alec barking out to some hapless 12-year-old in the cast Stop running around like a chicken with your head cut off and other such imprecations. Uh, Alec was wonderful. We, we, we got to see a lot of each other over the years as I, as I um, uh, was often invited to their marvelous home on Woodhouse Road in Colaba, where plays would take place on the terrace and the sketches. Um, uh, Pearl and Alec uh, were just bubbling with not just creative energy, but an enthusiasm for life which infected many of us. I then moved away from Bombay as my parents were transferred to Calcutta um, and didn't see very much more of Alec, but stayed in touch as adults many, many years later as rather advanced adults when I came back from my long stint of the United Nations to, um, to live and work in India again and Alec was kind enough to reach out. Um, I will regret the many invitations to Christmas Eve parties at his building Christmas Eve that I never quite managed to attend in Bombay since I was either stuck in Delhi or in my constituency of Tiruvannantapuram. But we had a lot of pleasant email exchanges and seeing the spark of Alik Padamsi coming out again in this book is a particular joy. I wish you all um, a, a great deal of happiness in remembering Alik on this special occasion 
and I hope you will read the book and along with Vandena Saxena Poria that you will celebrate the mind and the heart of our great friend Alik Padamsi who will live on for a long long time in all of us and in all that he's left behind. Thanks very much and may the book be a great success. That was lovely. That was lovely. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Shamak Dava. But before that, a short alikism. Shamak Dava started his career with Alec in the theater in Evita, then went on to play many, many roles in his musicals, Cabaret and Tarantula Tansy and more. He also choreographed the Asian track and field games. Shamak is a singer, songwriter, performer, director, entertainment designer, choreographer, teacher, celebrity judge, and philanthropist. Shamak Dava is an entertainment icon. Known as the guru of contemporary dance in India, Shamak is the founder and artistic director of the world's largest dance education movement, which has enriched the lives of over a million dance enthusiasts across India, Canada, the UAE, and the UK. He won a national award for his first feature film choreography, Dil to Pagal Hai. Shamak, over to you. He's going to read us a bit from the chapter, School versus Edutainment. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ryan. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here because this is something that is so important for me because Alec was like everything to me. He hijacked my mind from the moment he said, I want you, like Uncle Sam, when he, when he asked to do his musical. Uh, and we have to say that he was everything to me and I am really what I am because of him. So let me read this to you. For years, education in this country and almost all over the world was about rote learning. Britain was in India during the Victorian period. Our rulers, after the Beatles, just imagine a different life could have been. The Beatles generation disrupted the culture of Britain completely. It was an exciting time over there where people were doing mad things that didn't have logic. No linear thinking, but squiggly thinking all over the place. If post Britain had ruled India. I think India would be quite a different place. We actually have Britain ruling over us during its worst period, as it's most conventional with, don't answer back, little boys should be silent and only speak when they're spoken to. And as for the little girls, <laughs> we've continued in this trap, this time worshipping the false god of education. We still handcuffed the old system. Absolutely true. Education here in India is for the teacher to dictate no questions asked. A lot has changed abroad, which I must say is very good. But most of what is taught in schools is unfortunately still very much by rote, where you learn by heart, faithfully reproduce in the examination, and you pass to get your degree. Do you really want a degree that says you're nothing more than a robot? Garbage, garbage out. I mean, look at history. These poor kids today have to learn all these dates and read them off in the exam. They get marks, marks for getting the dates right. But who cares about the date if they don't understand the truck of why the war was fought or the significance of the action? History is not about it. History says it was a man like Gandhiji that we got our independence through gun violence, which everyone said was impossible. Now, how do you do that? Can we bring that teaching in? In Xavier's I was on the advisory committee. I said to the principal, look, one of the main problems that students face is the teaching method. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, when I was in college, and I think even until today, most professors, professors tend to dictate knowledge not to teach it. And it doesn't work for the students. The professors have a with the syllabus and literally force it down the student's throat with no creativity. I think that's wrong. I think if they could make the students fall in love with the subject, the students would educate themselves. That's the job of the not to tell the student but to tempt the student to fall in love with the subject. I'm saying education for the learner to learn and not for the teacher to teach. Wow. 
It's for the teacher to enthuse and it's for the learner to be enthusiastic enough to be able to learn on their own. That's what education is about. I love it. <laughs> Lovely Sharma, and you read it exactly as he the way he would say it. Absolutely, it was like I'm, I'm looking up and I'm saying, Oh my god, is that Sharma? Is that Daddy? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> All the right emphasis. Oh my god, okay, so Sharma, this is that tricky one in the learning process of life. What did you learn most from Alec, and how did he make you unlearn what you already knew? You know, when I came uh, to Alec as a dancer in Evita, uh, I had just finished a flop show called Tommy, where I was a dancer and it ran for exactly five shows. And then suddenly I land up with uh, Alec. And the first thing he did was, obviously he trained us, great rehearsals. What stunned us, at the same time I was doing a musical called Grease. And he heard me singing and he heard me acting and... And he came back to me and said, look, uh, someone's leaving the show and I want you on my show. So I said, no, problem, I'll come. And he said, it's Evita and then blah, blah, blah. And then I became this Che Guevara and I played the role. Alec, I'll tell you something, was literally like a father to me. I have never heard him scream at me ever. He screamed at everybody around. Everybody actually <laughs> and shaked when Alec was in the room. And suddenly, like a, I don't know, like this mental kids, though, he would suddenly turn, <laughs> uh, how are you all? Is everything okay now? So he would just suddenly change. So he really didn't mean his, that's what I meant to say. He was just very firm on discipline. All the discipline I have learned is from him. You know, before he passed away, how many times he came for my show? I think Ronnie also came for my show. It was called Selkut. And, you know, he said to me, Shamak, you've really all that I've taught you. I'm so proud of you that you're, you know, to your students and the way you've done it. So I was so kicked like a little child. And when he actually, uh, Selkut got over and the audience got up to leave and he shouted in the audience, Shamak! <laughs> I, I died for five seconds because it was a very loud shout, you know? And, you know, he was like the god of everything. He was, he was just one of the kind people. I don't know if that's something to be, uh, you know, debated on, but he was wonderful with me. And I learned much before I came to him. So I never had to unlearn anything because what was all with him, you see, it wasn't that I came as a 40 year old who had learned stuff in theater. I was so new. I was doing nothing. I was just there. And all that he taught me, I brought into my foundations and my education systems. And I remember his one little pad, return to AP. Do you remember that return? <laughs> oh God. I, and every day I tell my office people, I said, where is your coming back to me? Return to me. You never come back to me. Why? So it was so stuck in my head. And we were, as Ronnie said, we were little fledglings. We were people who were just learning and coming to learn things. So it was, yeah. it was a very exciting time in my life. And Alec Badamsi has been, besides family, someone helped me. A lot. That's lovely. I think he nurtured you a lot, Shama. Really. I mean, no, he you know, really he... did. I swear he did. I don't know what. I was so special. I remember for Cabaret, I was asked to do the lead role, but uh, there was a debate going on that, you know, there was somebody else going to do that role. And Alec furiously said to everyone, he says, I want Shama. That's it. And I remember him saying this to me afterwards I only want you. No one else can do this. And that's when I played that Joel Gray role in Cabaret as the MC. And Sharon was with me. And I had a wonderful time with Sharon. I cannot tell you how much she also helped me in this process. But it was the most wonderful, wonderful years of my life. Beautiful. Yeah. And I'm sure you would, you would recommend the theatre as a source of discipline to everyone. <laughs> Telling theatre and dance are only the strongest disciplines in the world. I'm telling you something. Sure. And all these great dancers, they're all disciplined, and that's how they've been super in actors. Theater actors, also, if you see today on screen, they're the best actors. Their, their timing, their understanding, you can't touch it. And that's, I'm telling you, you know, so that's how I got from Alec. I got so much discipline from theater and from dance education that it was only Alec.
who really made me understand discipline. And I really didn't understand at that time. I was, I was quite a... Happy was, yeah. yeah, but he was really so... You know, I'm telling you, I know nobody believes me, but Carla Singh was my choreographer then, would scream at me every day, but never Alec. <laughs> <laughs> never Alec. He screamed at everybody. And, uh, and if, if I said to Alec, I said, Alec, you know, I should do it like this, I think, you know, with this kind of accent in Cabri. And he says, hmm, okay, try it. He never would say no to me, you know. He never said no to anyone. He always listened. He always said, okay, try it. That's my... Right. And so that's what the book also is about, you know, about alternate ideas, about alternate ways of going about the same thing, but making it, you know, something about your own life, not necessarily what somebody has told yes. you to do or what you need to do or that you have to conform to do. You have to reclaim your life. I think that's also very important. And that's what he did to me. He made me believe that I was okay doing theater, okay doing my dance classes, okay singing, dancing, acting. You know, right. yeah, he said, and I'm so happy. Those many years ago, it was unheard of. I mean, it was unheard of and also looked down upon, Ryle. The amount of I had to go through that struggle, the keep on, it was horrible. It was horrible. But then when I came to Christmas Eve or my uh, Kulsum Terrace, it was as if, you know, there was something like, oh, I'm in my home again. It was just home because that's yeah. what I meant to do. I actually would yeah. wait for those shows, for the rehearsals. The rehearsals were the best thing. The chicken biryani, the musti, the, oh my God. It was, it was like a breath of fresh air that you came home from the struggle of trying to do everything and everyone saying, no, you can't do it. Are you a pansy? Are you crazy? Are you mad? This is a, what a girl should be doing dancing. But Alex said, listen, he used, of, of course, some beautiful words in the meaning and says, you do what you have to do. I believe in you. I've, you know, Alex really had faith in me. And when Kwasar was doing a prayer backstage for a show, he said, you know, you should start the prayer because really he treated you like a son. He did. And that's why I love him. And I learned too much from him. He did. And look what you did. You took all the tools and you're, you know, yeah. you're the best at your game. I mean, you know, you're world renowned. There's nothing stopping right. you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you everyone. Time. Thank you. For sharing. Lovely for sharing. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have our very last poll. And over to you, Vandana. Great. Okay, our last poll. You've heard some of the really crazy ideas this evening, you know. Should we be making education more edutaining? Um, we, we've heard about how the uh, how the workplace should be transformed. But our final poll, we're going back to the example that I gave right in the beginning. And it's a controversial one, so we're really looking forward to seeing what your thoughts are. Can we have the poll up? Here we go. Should marriage licenses be renewed every five years to keep the marriage alive? Remember, mm -hmm. the purpose is not to destroy the marriage, it's to keep it alive. Um, we'd really like to know your thoughts. We're going to keep the polling on for maybe another 10 seconds. Oh, I can tell you that it is definitely leaning one way. I won't say which way it's leaning. I uh, don't want to do what uh, the pundits on television do, which is try and indicate which way it's going. But no, let's see what you think. Should marriages, marriage licenses be, be renewed every five years to keep the marriage alive? Remember, it's an anonymous poll. All right, can we share the results? A whopping 66% of you say yes. That's great. We want to hear your comments on the book and all the crazy ideas that Alex got in the book. Rael, back to you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Vandana. Okay, here's a very special part. In order to truly hijack your mind, Dad wrote his own suggested version of the Ten Commandments, and here we have a video of it for you.
wow. So I saw Shamak nodding his head vigorously <laughs> and several others as well. Well, it's something to think about for sure. And I'm sure once you get the book, you'll see lots more. You know, dad truly believes in the goodness of pe people, of life and the positivity it can spread beyond ourselves. And so he wants us to really ponder over this and come up with our own 10 commandments. It would be great for you to share your commandments with us on the Gmail account mentioned in the chat right now. And listen to this, the five lucky winners get absolutely complimentary copies of the book of Let Me Hijack Your Mind. We would now be opening the chat for those of you that would like to ask questions to the co-author, Vandana Saxena Poria. And in the meanwhile, I would like to ask my brother Kwasa to throw some light on the lighter side of our father, Alec. Um, wow. Uh, hijacking a mind. I think uh, Rael, Shazan and myself can can properly lay claim to the fact that we were the first draft of most of any idea when he tried to hijack someone's mind. And often we were the ones who got hijacked quite a lot. Um, but the, the interesting thing was was the way that, that dad's mind worked or AP. When we talked work, he was AP. When we were talking kebabs, it was dad. Um, but the way he worked um, was that he always saw everything as a, as a problem um, that needed to be solved. Everything was a puzzle um, and everything that he wanted to, to try and, and work in. And, and for a long time, it was quite infuriating because Shazan, myself, Ryle, we'd go to him with, with small, little pro, small little issues or something that we were just thinking about. And he'd immediately try to solve it rather than just listen and agree or feel, you know, uh, uh, be supportive. He was trying to fix it. Everything had to be fixed and everything had to be made better. Um, and in fact, it was, it was one of those weird things. And, and he loved cross-pollinating. So we take something from one place, something from another and, and make it happen. And Ronnie talked about uh, the pad, uh, which he used to carry. And later on, it, was, it, it moved to this size with, with various things. And I remember I was in school once and he'd come to watch the school play and he kept taking copious notes during the play. And everyone in the school went, oh my God, you know, he's watching our play, he's taking notes and, you know, he'll have something to say. So at the end of it, I went up and asked him, I said, you know, what did you think? And, you know, what did you write down? And his notes were about anything but the play. They were about changing the water system in Bombay, about how to avoid traffic, how to make things. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, yes, the play inspired these thoughts. And this is where I went. So his, his notes were, had nothing to do. I had to go back to all the students and go, uh, yeah, he said good things. Uh, because I, I, and, and that's really the kind of the way he worked. So even, even his pad, for example, was a problem because it would make his pants heavy and it was difficult. So he then started tailoring his own shirts, which had four pockets, of which one of them would fit this pad perfectly, um, which I am now wearing in his honor. Um, but my, the best time where I discovered who he was and how his mind worked and how he hijacked things and how he problem solved was, uh, pretty much when he was already, you know, uh, in his late seventies or early eighties, I went over for dinner. Um, and then we're, we're, we're sitting in his room and I noticed a wire that was going from his pillow from under his pillow on his bed, all the way out the window. And I was like, what is that, dad? And he went, oh, uh, that's a bell. I said, yes, but where does it go? So he said, you know, the other night I came home, most likely from Enigma at about four in the morning because he liked partying and just going the night away. But he's like, I came home and I found the watchman asleep. So I said, yeah, dad, they all do double shifts, you know, this, that, the other. And, you know, it, it, it's hard. He said, yes, I understand that. But, but that means the building is not safe. So I went, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good point. She said, I got thinking about how do I make the building safe? And then he realized that because he had a bad back in the middle of the night at various points when he just needed to turn, he'd wake up, turn, and then go to sleep again. So he decided that every time he would turn, he would press this button, which led to a bell that went downstairs to the watchman. And the watchman then had to stand up walk onto the road and bang his lati on the ground three times, right? Before AP would finally fall asleep again. So we all talk about 
temper, ego, all of that. But I'd just like to say that at the age of 80, after being the head of Lintas in 70 odd plays, my fa our father was the watchman of his building. And that's how mad his mind worked. <laughs> All right, I think there are a lot of questions that are coming in. Uh, thank you all for being here. And Vandana, uh, over to you to, to kind of answer these, these incredible questions that are in there. <laughs> I remember hearing that story from you, Q, and being creased up with laughter. And Alec was like, you know, why do you think this is funny? <laughs> that was great. Okay, um, so thank you for the questions. Keep them coming in. I'm just going to go through the chat box and I'm I'm just going to pick them out. One thing that I learned through writing this book is um, I learned persistence and dedication. Um, really, uh, one of the one of the chapters is about tips and tricks. And Shamak was talking and Ronnie talked about, you know, using the pad, etc. One of the things that Alec talked about is um, being persistent and being curious. Um, and being passionately curious. So when Alec passed, I was kind of in a real tiz, like, because we'd agreed what was going to be in the book. We'd written part of the book. And I, I was like, oh my goodness. But I had the transcripts and I had Rael and I had Q and I had Shazan and Sharon and, and Shamak and, uh, you know, everyone, everyone came together to really um, help answer questions. So, I think, you know, not just being persistent, but I think being courageous. He taught me how to be courageous, to, to really examine these ideas and uh, get people's opinions on them. So that, that I think that's several things that I learned. Um, I hope that answers your question, Harsha. Uh, okay, Twinkle and Urban, what was it like trying to capture and condense a mind like Alex into a concise and coherent book? I cannot tell you how many copious cups of coffee it took me, Glenda Watzer and Yamini Watzer. Um, when we did all the transcripts, we highlighted, uh, there were 53, um, 53, uh, you know, sort of conversations that I'd had with him, 170 plus hours um, of conversations in the transcripts. And we highlighted them and we put them up on this massive whiteboard and started to look for similarities um, and everything. One thing you, you probably don't know, maybe you can guess about me, but you may not know about Alec. Alec was so ADHD, attention deficit, you know, so his mind would go here, there, everywhere, right? And so would mine. So as a result, each hour where we talked was like five hours for everyone else. So I didn't have 173 hours. I had a thousand, a thousand hours that I literally had to go through. Um, but it was an amazing process as we saw the threads coming together and it led to exactly this, Alec hijacks your mind, um, hence the name of the book. Um, so it was, it was a privilege, um, um, an experience uh, that, uh, that I will treasure for the rest of my life. Um, okay, so Harshal has asked another really interesting question, uh, which is, one underlying virtue which Alex had taught while working, and how did he react in terms of disagreement? Um, Alec was really good at pushing back, but he was also like, he understood things not, could not stand still. He, he was like, nature is constantly moving, so must I. So when I would poke him on a particular topic, and there were some really heated debates about certain things, like testosterone in men, you'll see that in the book, um, you know, I would push back and say, but Alec, this, and he would listen and he'd say, send me something on it. And then he'd go, you know, true. I hadn't thought about it like that. So I loved the fact that he was willing to shift his viewpoint. And I think if the rest of the world did that, we would live in a much, um, a much more amazing place. He was ready to have dialogues about areas where there was disagreement. Um, I hope that helps. Um, I think we've got another couple of minutes. So um, here we go. I'm trying to go. Okay. Um, what was your experience with Alex uh, when working? How inspirational he, was he to everyone? I mean, it goes beyond, you know, people who would come in to see him for two minutes. In that two minutes, he would have such an amazing interaction with them that it, it made them feel like they'd spent half an hour with him. He just had that ability to make you the center of the universe. 
and he he had the ability to empower you. Shamak talked about this, um, but um, and Ronnie and everyone's talked about this. He had the power to just make you feel like you could do it. And I really hope the book helps all of you realize that you can do it. Those things in your life that you're just putting up with, you don't have to put up with them. There's things that you can do to change it. He gives you frameworks in the book. I, I hope, um, I really hope you get a chance um, to read it. Ryan, how are we doing for time? Um, I think we have one last question, one last question. One last question, I am, okay, here we go. Um, the book is amazing from Cyrus Irani. I got my copy from Amazon, so enjoyed having my mind hijacked. How did you take the concepts and stream of consciousness and come up with a well-organized and easy to follow and understand book? It took a long time. It took a <laughs> long time. Um, but you know, uh, what was really good was there was Q and Rael who are mini Alex, right? And Shazan and Sharon's input as well. And even Ida, his mate, you know, all of them were, especially Raul, darling, don't you think the book is too light here? Daddy would have said more here. And so, you know, they all helped me kind of work out where things should go. Um, but I really have to give credit to Glenda and Yamini Watsa, who really, really helped me kind of put it all together. And, and an extended, you know, sort of extended joint family of all my friends, including my parents, who just helped me kind of piece together various bits. Um, it took a lot of time. And I think this was the other thing that I learned from Alec. Don't rush it. Don't rush it. Something good is going to be like a fine wine. You've got to do a bit, leave it for a bit, let it mature, taste a little bit, add a couple of ingredients and then kind of move on. And I, I think I, I luckily had the opportunity to do that. Um, so thank you. I'm, I'm glad it was coherent for you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Vandana. Really, um, before we go, I really want to say a special happy birthday <laughs> to our father. And, uh, you know, us kids would spend every birthday with him and just us with him. And we'd have the most crazy times, Q, Chaz. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it was really very special. And I just feel that today we seem to have done you know, a similar kind of uh, evening with him. And I think he really, really must be enjoying it a lot. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd really like to thank all our panelists from Shibana to Shashi, Rani, Gurcharan, Shamak, of course, Vandana, you, our whole team, thank you so much for being here. The book is available on Amazon as well as Crossword. Check your chat box for the purchase links. We'd also like to thank Sagar Bekal for the cover of the book, Amy Fernandez from Literature Live, Tarani Uppal, Disha Runayak, and the team at Penguin, Glenda Watsa, Harshal Shah, Rachit Ketan, Arjun Iyer, Craig De Quadris, and Sequera, Natasha Aravdhanu, Shivani Mishra, Pearl Barsiwala, Rubina Khan, Ruk Ruskin Santa Maria, Lisa Roderick, Krishma Shah, and Harshada, and the team at ACE. So, in the words of Alec Padamsi, let me hijack your mind and restart your life to freedom. Thank you, everyone, and good night.